Anicca. Anicca is one of the three characteristics of existence. Everything on this side of the Big Bang has these characteristics. One is Anicca, which means not permanent. Everything's changing. From the level of galaxies to mind moments, to thoughts, to relationships, to civilizations, to continents, everything's changing. The second characteristic of existence is dukkha, which is that because of anicca, everything's subject to being quite, at least somewhat, unsatisfactory. You know, you finally get it together, your relationship is finally really working, or you get the right job, or you finally get the right party in power, and then it changes. That's, and there's suffering in that. There's also the suffering of sickness, old age, and so on. And then the third characteristic of exist, existence, anatta, which is the one that, mo that we really have the most difficulty with, it literally translates as no soul. That there's nothing enduring about us. We're, this experience of self is kind of a phantom, and um, eventually we discover that we actually are the universe. We actually are, we're, as Ramdas used to put it, uh, we are God in drag. I guess, now will that be outlawed in some states, I suppose? God will no longer pose as human beings. Dress up. Again, from Ram Dass, he said that when we, when, he, when we get up in the morning, we pull on our somebody suit. And we generally pull on the same somebody suit. I'm the same somebody again today. So this is a poem about Anicca, impermanence, by a fellow named Gary Rosenthal. Somehow, we're in a prison, a prison without walls. Some of the inmates are Buddhist lined up to be photographed by some kind of hologram camera, a device capable of revealing our previous incarnations. To get the focus right, they turn it on an outer wall of a hamburger joint in San Francisco. You see layers removed, a succession of different colors of paint, images of painted hamburgers advertised with progressively lower prices till there's just a bare slice of wood then a raindrop, then a cloud, an aggregate of dancing molecules whirling into forms. You see what was true of the wall must be true of you. Incredible, you keep saying, incredible. And then you wake up. Somehow we're in a prison, a prison without walls. Some of the inmates are Buddhists lined up to be photographed by some kind of hologram camera a device capable of revealing our previous incarnations. To get the focus right, they turn it on an outer wall of a hamburger joint in San Francisco. You see layers removed, a succession of different colors of paint, images of painted hamburgers advertised with progressively lower prices. Till there's just a bare slice of wood, then a raindrop, then a cloud, an aggregate of dancing molecules whirling into forms. You can see what is true of the wall must be true of you. Incredible, you keep saying, incredible. Good morning, Mr. Dalton. And refuge in the Buddha. I think it's true. Most, if not everybody who walks through these front doors 
has discovered in one way or another that their strategies for happiness are failing them. Right? We're discovering that Costco doesn't do it or that the gated community doesn't do it or that the longed for child as miraculous as that is, doesn't do it. That relationship doesn't do it. There's always this, there's this longing. There's, it's like there's something more. There's got to be something more. You recognize that feeling, that longing? I think that's what brings us through the front door. I think that's what keeps some of us coming back 50 years later. And we discover that, in fact, there is some resolution to that longing, which is that it's, wake, it's waking up, and it's the, it's the core of every spiritual tradition. Every, every tradition is a different finger pointing at that experience. Um, and it's not dogma. Many of us, many of us have been on this trip already, but, and... Religions tell us that it's in the book. The book was divinely inspired or the book has been passed down, like in Buddhism, the book has been passed down for all these generations. And the books, the books are helpful. They are good pointers. But ultimately, it's our own direct experience that will set us free. Anything we believe is kind of an equation. The more a spiritual or religious tradition is based upon belief, the more they try to convert you. And why do we try to convert other people? Because we're not sure we're right. If we can just keep getting converts, then I can just be more, I can feel more secure in my beliefs. And beliefs are fragile, utterly fragile. And so that's where in the Buddhist tradition, there's this refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And it's, it can be a religious practice, but I think of it more as a spiritual undertaking. There was a person called the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, who lived about 2,600 years ago. He died. And he was an ordinary person. He wasn't the one and only. He was someone who woke up and figured out how he did it and then spent the rest of his life going around teaching people. But when we take refuge in the Buddha, it's not in that historical figure. It's in that aspect of ourselves, which is awake. That's going to be the core of my talk today. What is this awakeness? What is this awakeness? And I take refuge in the Dharma, in the teachings, but also in the way things actually are. What a relief. Oh, what a relief to take refuge in now being okay as it is. Pleasant, unpleasant, healthy, sick. And we take refuge in the Sangha, which is the community of practice. And also our forebears who've, who've practiced before us and who point and say, this is, this is a way. You can do this and wake up. And so this little song is a modernization of refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha that's been done in Buddhist countries for 2,600 years. So please join in, sing with me if you want. I take refuge in the Buddha, the one who shows me the way in this life. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya. I take refuge in the Dharma, the way of understanding and love. Namo Dharmaya, Namo 
dharmaya namo dharmaya i take refuge in the sangha the community of mindful harmony namo sangaya namo sangaya namo sangaya I find it very interesting how that last note is very satisfying. It's like it finishes the chord quite. So, my friends. Let's stop and sit for a while. We're pretty busy beings. Just remembered something I promised I would, to myself I would do today. We have at the back of the room two devices for the hearing impaired. If you can't hear me easily, those are hooked right into the soundboard so you'll hear really clearly. So, if we stop and sit comfortably upright, and we turn attention inward, we can notice that there is a body sitting here. And this body is tangible. It is noticeable. Awareness, which co arises with the body, can experience the life in the hands. The life in the feet. the life in what we call the face. And bodies do something pretty remarkable. They're alive to begin with. And they breathe. And that in breathing and out breathing manifests itself in the chest and abdomen, 
expanding and contracting. And also in sensations at the nostrils. And awareness with intention can come home and abide in these sensations of in-breathing and out-breathing. And very quickly, it becomes apparent that the mind really does have a mind of its own and that it, it's very prone to wandering off. It wanders into desires into wanting. And or it wanders into the opposite of desires of disliking. It's the desire for something to stop, to not exist. The mind wanders as restlessness and agitation, as worry, as sleepy dullness, sloth and torpor, as doubt, as emotions, And so, as a practice, as a strategy of awakening, we can plan, we can form an intention to stay here, to stay home with the breath, with the sensations of in and out breathing. And this then allows, potentiates, noticing when the mind is wandering and then allows us to come home. Very simple. Utterly simple.
one dimension of mindfulness is awareness, a presence, the knowing faculty. And it can know this is an in-breath, rising, rising of the chest. This is an out-breath, falling, falling. It can know this is awakening from wandering. It can know this is wandering into desire, into wanting something, or wandering into disliking. It can know sleepy dullness, sloth and torpor. It can know restlessness, agitation. It's that which is awake. Awakeness. It also has a quality of remembering. Remembering, what am I doing here? Well, yeah, I, I have this intention to stay with the breath when I can. It has this ability to remember, to remember when the mind is off wandering. Somehow it remembers to wake up. What a strange thing. We might draw attention to the region of the universe that we each think of as my hands. And when you do that, do you find hands? Or do you find a field of life having no resemblance to the word hands at all. If you were to do the same thing with the feet, do you find feet? Or perhaps you find the field of energy or cold or hot warm.
And if we were to ask, where do the thoughts come from? Where are they experienced? Is there a place? Or is it non-local? Thoughts just occur. Who is it who receives the thoughts? Is there an answer to this not in thinking? Where do they occur? They just exist. They just occur in mind somehow. And we have this profoundly simple practice. Come home to the breath. Not some idea of the breath, the actual sensations of in-breathing and out.
This is a teaching rooted in nonviolence. Not just nonviolence in the world, but nonviolence internally. It's non coercive. And a very simple and potent way of operationalizing that comes from the great Thai master Achan Cha. Whenever you want to bring your practice into perfect balance, just remember this moment is like this. It's like this, the mind is concentrated or not. Maybe the mind is at ease or is upset, unsettled somehow. Maybe there's a sense of faith and confidence, or maybe this is one of those times when life is very uncertain. Maybe there's deep faith or significant doubt. It's like this. And all of a sudden, the battle is gone. Gone, gone. It's like this. Discomfort may arise in the body if we sit for longer. It may already be discomfort. We can notice discomfort or pain and come back to the breath. Or if it persists, we can take that very discomfort or pain as our meditation object to tune into it to become intimate with it, to become very close with it, to explore it. To befriend it. as well as being rooted in nonviolence, this is also the practice of love. Not romantic love, but the love in which there's room for everything. What if there's nothing wrong with you? What if there never has been? What if you don't have to spend the rest of your life trying to improve yourself? That your practice could be, oh, this is how I am. This is how humans are. And there's the simple and beautiful mantra, I love you with your name at the end. I love you with your name at the end. Why not? Be generous. The truth is that your life has been much more difficult than you let on to yourself. And the same is true for everyone else. And if we take a moment to remember this, how much dukkha there's actually been, how can we be anything but loving? And the same then would be true for our loved ones and our friends. 
each other. So we could say something on the in-breath like, may I be content and happy. May I love myself. And may this be true on the out-breath for all beings. May I be happy, may all beings be happy. And the happy isn't just the happiness of good mood, it's the happiness of deep contentment, of deep being. We could imagine, there's all kinds of things we can do with the mind. We could imagine that sitting in the middle of our heart, the middle of your heart, there sits a golden figure, a Buddha or a Kuan Yin or something, a Mary, a Jesus, or some unnamed source of love. And just imagine that that golden light is radiating and filling your entire body. It radiates out into your hands and fingers and down into your legs, through your abdomen, all through the pelvis into the legs and the thighs and calves and shins and feet and toes, up into the head, the neck, the shoulders, the face, into your emotional body, the places where you feel sad or lonely or frightened or self-hating or confused. And so you let yourself fill with love. And then you can imagine that your body becomes that, that golden Buddha creature expands and th their skin becomes exactly contiguous with yours. And then you can feel that surface of your body and imagine that from that flows all the love in the universe. We can imagine you become the Buddha, you become Kuan Yin, you become Mary or Jesus or Krishna. There's nothing to do with this. We just radiate out this imagination, this truth, actually. And now noticing the intention to let your eyes open. It's an interesting thing to do, to let your eyes open and remember that you are capable of radiating infinite love. So we open our eyes into a world, into a room, into a Zoom room with the thought, perhaps, may all beings be happy. May all beings be free from all forms of suffering. And notice the mystery of the eyes opening and then seeing. Seeing. And then maybe when seeing is established, be aware of it. And then look around this room. And on Zoom, you can look around on the Zoom screen. Look around. Don't hesitate to turn around and see. And if your eyes happen to meet, you might presume that this person is wishing you well. May you be well. And so we can go through the world as the Buddha. That's kind of fun. Walking through the mall, knowing what you are. And so is everyone else. The Sufis have practices, they call it tasawari, which means being. 
And then you walk, you walk around the room being Kuan Yin, or maybe doing gestures like Kuan Yin or something. And it's, to have a room full of Kuan Yins is pretty cool. How are you doing? Do you feel less? Do you feel better than when you walked in the door? Raise your hand if you feel better. Take, take a moment to look around. Keep your hand up. All you did for the, next, for the last 45 minutes was nothing. And you feel better. That's interesting data. That might lead you to take 45 minutes a day or twice a day to stop. You could say, I'm going to be a meditator now. Or you could just say, I'm doing what feels good. We have some we have some really bizarre notions. And that is that we can feel better by accumulating stuff and people and buying things. And when what really makes us feel better is stopping. And the research, the research is really solid. I mean, it's people who meditate get sick less. Why else would insurance companies be so willing to pay for mindfulness-based stress reduction courses? They don't do it out of the goodness of their heart because insurance companies <laughs> are heartless. <laughs> insurance companies are designed to make money for the investors, right? And so uh, John Kabat-Zinn is the great hero of mindfulness-based stress reduction. He's run over 100,000 people through his program at the University of Massachusetts Med Center. And lo and behold, people who meditate, it's a significant, the, the, their research is 45 minutes a day, six days a week. So that's a fair amount. However, people who do that use 50% fewer healthcare dollars in the next few years. What? They also feel better. So that's my little pitch for meditation. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of announcements. <laughs> I also have a joke. I don't know. Maybe I could show it to you. I'll read you the caption in a minute. It's a service dog with a with the leash. And it says, if a service dog approaches you and he is alone, it means that the owner can't move and is in trouble. Follow him and you will get a free wallet. That's a bad message, isn't it? Forget that I read that. There's another message here from Candle. Oh. <laughs> oh, she sent me a joke back. Um, could you please put in one last push for the meditation movement and crystal bowl special event coming up next Saturday? They need, people need to bring a sack lunch, comfy things for lying on the floor if they choose to, and also no movement practice experience is necessary. Folks can sit out dan if dancing is challenging in any way and still enjoy the sacred energy of the group. She's doing that with a woman whose name I forget. It's on the website, portlandinsight.org. It's a day of movement and meditation and a very loving environment.
Anything else I should announce? Oh yeah, I know. Beck, would you bring me the black bowl, please? Vanna, may I have the bowl, please? <laughs> That's an age-related comment. Laura, hello. Want to do a down announcement? <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to. You don't have to. You do? All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, they should. This is Laura Dow, an astounding human being who also happens to be the chair of our board. Indeed, and she's just in time. Wait, uh, come walk by me. I'll do. We'll do like a football handoff. Walk by. Walk. Walk by. Here, walk. 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 Walk slowly. Walk by. Hey, I don't. That's. I missed it. Um, okay, can you hear me? Oh, no, no, you need this. Oh, dear, hang on. Oh, here, this is it. Okay, so Donna, the uh, Buddhist practice of generosity. It is a way for us to um, kind of think about all that we have, be mindful about the things we have in our life, and find ways to help others. Hmm. One of the things you can do is help PIMC. You're thinking, why do we need to help PIMC? It'd be a valid question. These teachers show up at our weekly sits today, other, every morning, and they offer you teachings of the Donna, things they've spent their whole lives learning about. And you can thank them through a gift. They teach you about the Dharma. And you can offer them Donna, sorry, <laughs> a little unprepared. Um, so you can do that a number of ways. This is um, an alms bowl, and you could literally just put cash or a check right in here, but you can also give online. Um, go to do portlandinsight.org and you can give one time or you can give a monthly donation. Um, you can give whenever and however it makes sense to you. But by doing that regular practice, not only are you supporting the work of this center, you're also giving yourself a chance to be mindful about where your money goes and how much how you wanna use that in the world. So whether you give here, whether you give somewhere else, I encourage you to bring Donna into your practice. Yes. Pardon? We do not have Venmo as of today, but hopefully very soon. I know. <laughs> I, I know. Am, I am two thirds of the way through creating a Venmo account. I got <laughs> locked out of an email account that I needed to. But yes, that we're going to have Venmo, and it will be uh, there will be Venmo. You know the the little what's it called the QR code by the door and. Uh, Thank you, Laura. There's something else cooking here. Please give me a moment. To... Nice to stop. Isn't it? I spent yesterday here with a couple were absent, nine next generation teachers who will be beginning to attend more and You'll, you'll get to see much of them. And we had a long conversation about a process that we're engaging in now, which is that um, 
This place has been my baby. In 2000, Ruth Dennison handed me the first check for $10,000 and said, start a center. And I said, Ack, I have no idea how to do that. And she said, don't worry, people will come. And people have come now. We bought this building in 2004. We raised in a week, Jim was there, $470,000. Gifts from Ruth, large gifts from Ruth. Gifts from community members and loans from ourselves. And we bought this building. And there has been so much volunteer work. Oh, I wanted to mention volunteers. Doug, would you wave? Doug is our volunteer coordinator. There's another way you can give uh, to yourself and your community, which is connect with Doug and come and do some dusting or do some gardening, or we're going to get... We're going to get this volunteer thing together. Trina, who's one of our next generation teachers, is Vietnamese. <laughs> Funny. There's both tears and laughter here. I joke with her that she's the only real Buddhist here. <laughs> As she was born into a Buddhist family. But she's, she talks about the Vietnamese Buddhist center, which is a hub of life. People come and they bring food and they bring flowers. We have wonderful flowers. Thank you again, Allison. Buba, you bring flowers. And, but th the experience there is that the place is overrun with generosity. And there are events happening all the time. And people, people find it that there's a way they do community, which is different than we do. Because we don't really understand community. We don't, we, don't, we don't know how fully we can lean on each other. And need to. We rely on institutions rather than on each other. So anyway, we're engaged in a process where I am uh, withdrawing from being... And I'm no longer... Laura took over the board. I used to be the CEO of that. And... And my finger has been in every single aspect of this place. Every piece of art on these walls came from myself and my former partner. Um, and it's really time that I stop doing that. It's not time that I stop teaching, so you don't need to get worried that I'm going to disappear. But it is time that we support our existing teachers and our new teachers more and more, and that they step forward uh, and that our board gets stronger, and we're doing that it really, I think, wonderfully. We have a, a transition team that's helping me and us figure out how is it that we do a transition like this, because it's, it's an unusual thing. It has to do with um, succession as well. How do, we, how do we do this? And I want to invite you to be part of it. And... One of the ways you can be part of it has to do with Donna, with your generosity of time and funds that we are, I guess, let's be honest with this, we are underfunded. And uh, we've, we've always just scraped by. But uh, another wave of emotion. This place is really important. How many, well, I, I guess I could ask this. How many of you have experienced your life being pretty significantly transformed or improved by coming here? Look at that. Look at that. That, that says something, doesn't it? This is a functional Dharma Center. It's a pretty healthy organization, too. And <clears throat> I've been... I've been, I've been teaching for 40 years. That's so weird to say that. Um, but I've had so many people tell me, often with tears, I came in the front door and I was suicidal, or I came in the front door and I, there was no meaning in my life, or I came in the front and there's all this, this trauma that people walk through and then it, it becomes, it gets healed. 
And so it's really this transition that we're involved in is really an important thing. And learning how to participate fully in the, in the, in the life of the community is really an important thing, not just for us, but for the next person who walks through the door and the people five years and 10 years and beyond. So when we speak about Donna and uh, you know, the financial end of things, that's really important. And there's a lot of things that, that claim, that, that demand our, uh, our support. But I invite you to think about the importance of this. And uh, Jen, my wife and I are redoing our wills. And one of the things to think about also, <laughs> I could get on my, my, my uh, soapbox here. If you don't have a living will, an end of life directive, do it tomorrow because otherwise it's a mess. And if you don't have a will, you know who, who controls where all your stuff goes? The state. So one of the things you can do also is put PIMC in your in your will. People do that. That's how that's how many places build up big endowments and they're then financially secure because someone at the end of their life doesn't need their money anymore and they they give it to the organization to support the people who walk in the front door. So that's what wanted to be said. Mr. Dalton, oh, from here, Jim's going to do some movement, and then I'm going to give a shortish now Dharma talk because this happened. And then we'll walk through those doors and have some, some conversation with some very fine people. You want to come up, Jim, and I'll arrange the camera. I think if you'll come to my left here, I can make it work. Speaker view. Okay, now I get to you. A little further to my to the, oh no th that way, to that left. Yeah. Okay. Let me get further back now. Ah, hang on. Got to get rid of this. Nah. This way, and then this way. Uh huh. How about that? Settle for that? Do you want to see your feet? Yeah. Okay. Let's give you that. I think that's up. There you go. Here's this. There we go. <clears throat> centered in their world, centered in your world, centered in this world. Okay. How am I all these different people at one time? Let's uh, begin again with our awareness of the feet. We can drop the awareness lower and lower and lower into, into the body and feel that the Feet are in touch with solid earth. It looks like floor, flooring, but it's attached to the earth. We can feel the energy of the earth uh, below us. And we can engage with the earth in different ways. You know, we can uh, <clears throat> move forward and backward. And in a, in a normal uh stride you're shifting your weight into one leg swinging the other balancing 
swinging the opposite and balancing. <clears throat> And, and the body knows how to rearrange things so that it's fairly smooth and fairly uh, graceful all the way through. I'm not the most graceful dancer, but I can move across without falling on my face. So <clears throat> this amazing process of reorganizing the weight here, lifting, stepping, reorganizing the weight here. It's called posting up in Tai Chi. You step, and then you bring your back foot up and just rest it next to your instep. And the body knows how to handle that challenge. You step back and post up on the other leg. Open your stance and feel the relief in the body. You don't have a little one half of a square foot of, of, of a base. Now you have the whole width of your hips between your feet and you can slide over and move the weight into one leg and just hold it there for a while and feel all the different uh, tendons and muscles that activate in order to stabilize this form while the other leg over here it, it is relaxed, is resting, it's waiting. When is it, when's my turn? And then you move over and you can feel the engagement of all these different uh, sensations. Pressure, uh, tightness, uh, the sensitivity between your, your skin and, your, and the fabric of your clothes. The clothes hang differently when there's engagement. The clothes over here have a whole different feel to them. Okay, we open our arms <clears throat> and open the rib cage and our breathing changes. Opening and then releasing down. There's sensations of engagement again, lifting, engaging with the sky rather than the earth, you know, engaging with the space around us with open arms and uh, embracing the space around us and then settling the space, relaxing the space, soothing the space. We ordinarily take all of this space for granted and it's the last thing in our awareness but we can bring it into look how the space accepts this movement this movement this movement there's no resistance it opens to the engaged arm it opens to the relaxing hands the space is very compliant it accepts us wherever whatever we want to do and that not after doing that several times i'm breathing more more deeply i can open up my elbows away from the body and breathe even more deeply cuz i'm opening the space between the ribs with every in breath and all those little micro muscles are cooperating to make space inside just as we embrace the space outside we can make space inside and then release there's so much going on each time we breathe we're accepting the gift of life from the planet all this conglomeration of different gases is created by trees and plankton and shrubs and grasses and all sorts of <clears throat> forms of life are combining to support our life. Receiving a gift and then releasing a gift back to the planet. 
back to the trees, back to the plankton. We make use of the transformation of energy and then we release it over and over. And we can make it very, um, a little more demonstrative by, by embracing the space over here and drawing it in, switching and embracing over here and feeling how the rhythm of your breath and the rhythm of your center of gravity, you're, you're moving it back and forth with the breath or without. All of this collaboration is, you, is integrated. It's a bringing together, bringing into the center, engaging with the space over there, bringing it into the center. And then the floorboards help by telling us. Come to stillness, and that's the source of all the movement we do. But we're aware of when we're in the center and when we're engaged and when we're on the way, all those uh, phases of the cycles are, are impermanence. So again, opening, this move is followed by this move, is followed by these centering moves. Space receiving us, supporting us. Gathering right in the center of our heart. And then bringing our hands together in gratitude for another practice session of mindful movement. We'll see you again on the uh, third Saturday of uh, April now. <clears throat> and Next week, uh, um, Candle's going to be here with a friend to do some mindful movement. Okay. A week ago this morning, I got on a plane in Costa Rica in San Jose to come home. It was a bit of a shock. I brought with me some pretty nice Costa Rican chocolate. I'm going to pass these around. I invite you to take one or two. If you'd like, we're going to do a mindful eating practice. So don't eat them right away. <laughs> and so, and, and if, chocolate isn't on your diet we have almonds and we have raisins so please uh, would you would you pass these around and these and these hmm. all right sweetie hmm. all right and while they're doing that i'd like to brag for a moment you never see in here because this is the secret room, the sound room, and it's been absolutely chaotic for two years or more. And in the last week, I spent four hours cleaning it up, and it's pristine. And while I did it, I found one of my props that I haven't used in five years. Ah. Hey This is a pretty heavy bowling ball, and it demonstrates a spiritual truth. <laughs> what? 
It's a spiritual truth. <laughs> it's actually the equation that is, was at the root of the Industrial Revolution. Force equals mass times acceleration. And a body in motion tends to remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Pretty important stuff. And you will notice, be careful, Beck, that if I take this and roll it like, I gotta get my fingers out of it. <laughs> if I roll it like this, it will continue to roll until someone gets it and rolls it somewhere else. So I invite you to roll it around and enjoy changing its direction. Sorry to those of you on Zoom who couldn't see that. I'm solo here today, so we couldn't turn the camera. Force equals mass times acceleration. And a body in motion tends to remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Let me get this back to me. Boom. Okay. Does everybody have something? Thank you. These these will go to the living room. Hmm? Uh, yeah. Hang on. Well, no, they don't, you don't need to leave. Just, just put them down here. Okay. Ah, I have a poem. And perhaps a little story. No, I'll do the poem first. Okay. I'll tell you the story first. Many years ago, I invited Ruth Dennison to come and teach. It was the first time she taught a weekend retreat here. We were meeting at another center. We didn't have this center. And the people had brought their lunch. And she did a guided eating meditation like I'm going to do. However, she did it in a sort of extreme way, which was her style and skill. We were hungry. It was one o'clock in the afternoon, and we all got our lunch. And but she said, and "Let's let's do let's do a, a an eating meditation." And so we got out our lunches, and she said, "Spread it all out in front of you." And then she spent forty-five minutes preparing to have the first bite. And you could cut the tension in the room with a knife. It was like. It's like enough already, right? Your sandwich is there. You're... And then finally, she had us taking the first bite and then bringing it to our mouths. And we got it to about here. And she said, stop. I will not take that long. But it, it made clear how, it made greed really clear and anger and frustration and especially when you're really hungry for something or someone to get between you and the trough is really difficult. Now, why do this? My, my, in, my intuition of this talk this morning is it's one thing to become, it's, it's one thing to develop a daily sitting practice and it's pretty darn important. It's another thing to develop mindfulness in daily life. Actually, oh dear, a sneeze. Must you come now? Yes, you must. It would appear. Hang on. Uh, turn off the microphone.
but how to go about the day like when you walk out of here just when when you first leave the crash bar will be you'll hit that and then you'll be outside and then it will be cool and you could be aware of being cool and you then an image comes to mind, oh my car's over there so you turn to the right or the left and then you walk down the stairs and then at the stairs you turn right or left and then you might notice your coat needs to be done up because it's cooler or something oh i've got to do this on the way home some memory comes up and then you you walk to your car and then there's the um the incredibly responsible sacred act which is that you take these out and maybe you don't use a key you use a button or something and uh but and then you you let yourself into your car and this is a hugely important task of driving a car i could confess this i will i'm a really careful good driver and i drove a lot in costa rica and the roads are narrow a lot narrow and windy and uh i made a mistake and i still feel anxious when i talk about it i was following a truck big truck dump truck and we were almost out of gas and i was hungry and we were coming down a hill and i saw my chance to pass it was not a dotted line it was a double line but it was downhill and i knew i had the space and i pulled out and floored it and i got part way up the truck and then a bus was coming up the hill too fast and it was like it, not as fast as you would think but much faster and so i managed to get by this truck and out of the way with two seconds to spare it was tight bad move robert so it scared the bejeebies out of jennifer and the bus driver probably so when we put our hands on these we're really taking on a huge responsibility so then we get in the car and then well how do we drive consciously one thing is to not text another is to drive and to be aware of seeing i'm seeing turning left and turning right and maybe even talking it through being aware of touching the chair checking the mirror checking the mirror driving turning left right and so we drive more consciously and then we get home and then we get out of the car and then we we gather up our things can we do that mindfully can we do that and know that we're doing that and then we walk into the garage or into the house and we put our stuff down and then we greet someone do we do that mindfully and i think you're catching the theme here that we can do everything that we do there's no reason we can't be awake to what we're doing no matter what we're doing changing the baby's diaper unloading the dishwasher loading the dishwasher getting ready for bed brushing teeth all those rituals going to the toilet this is in the very in the satipatthana sutra the teachings on mindfulness by the buddha uh, they're not he didn't clearly didn't talk about driving but he said you know taking off the outer robe and taking off the inner robe and going to the toilet and and when eating when specify be mindful doing all these things and i i did that silly thing with the with the um, bowling ball because our life will continue in our robotic fashion for the rest of our lives unless there's an intervention and the inter the mo the most powerful intervention we can do is mindfulness because mindfulness lets us know what the next intention is right so when i'm practice when i'm present with the breath for instance or when i'm present with putting away the dishes or whatever it is i'm doing and then a thought comes to mind 
that thought is noticed. More likely that it's noticed. And that, that thought might be one that I want to restrain or it might be one I want to feed. Some thoughts lead to speech, some lead to action. And if I want to shape my destiny, which is what we have the opportunity to do if we're awake, then being awake moment by moment is really helpful. Is this making sense? It's a, it's a strategy. Bringing a little Carl Jung in here, it's very similar to the Buddha, that he said, an unexamined life is not worth living. The Buddha said, uh, so many quotes, better one moment of mindfulness than a year of good intentions, than a year of Oh, even, even, then a, a moment of mindfulness is so much more powerful than a moment even of generosity. Because mindfulness is where the lights come on and we can actually tell where we're going. Oh, and there's an image, I haven't, haven't thought of this in a long time. Imagine that, imagine that you're at that door and this room is completely black. And you know, you've been here before, and you know that there's a door over there, but it's dark. Not only dark, it's black. And there are whooshing sounds. And somehow, some intuition tells you, hmm, maybe I need to be careful here. And you happen to have a, a, um, a box of matches, you know, those nice wood matches. And uh, there also is a very, there's a high wind. It's about a 60 mile an hour wind that's blowing out. When you open the door, there's this wind. And you take a match and you light it. And for a moment you see, good God, there's a pendulum that's coming across. It's got a razor sharp blades and swinging across. And you think, huh, well, I'm gonna have to time this carefully. And then you use another of your precious matches. There's another moment of mindfulness. And you realize, okay, it sounds like this is it's coming. And you realize I can step to there. It's like video games, right? But having even moments of mindfulness allow us to change, the, change our destiny. Right? In, in comes a nasty text or email or something like that. And we have the impulse to act in a certain way. But we're mindful. And we can choose, how do I respond? So this is the poem I wanted to share with you. It's about mindfulness in every moment. It's called Aimless Love, and it's by Billy Collins. This morning, as I walked along the lakeshore, I fell in love with a wren. And later in the day, with a mouse, the cat had dropped under the dining room table. In the shadows of an autumn evening, I fell for a seamstress still at her machine in the tailor's window. And later for a bowl of broth, steam rising like smoke from a naval battle. This is the best kind of love, I thought, without recompense, without gifts or unkind words, without suspicion or silence on the telephone. The love of the chestnut the jazz cap and one hand on the wheel. No lust, no slam of the door, the love of the miniature orange tree, the clean white shirt, the hot evening shower, the highway that cuts across Florida. No waiting, no huffiness or rancor, just a twinge every now and then for the wren who had built her nest on a low branch overhanging the water and for the dead mouse still dressed in its light brown suit. But my heart is always propped up in a field on its tripod, ready for the next arrow. After I carried the mouse by the tail to a pile of leaves in the woods, I found myself standing at the bathroom sink, gazing down affectionately at the soap. So patient and soluble. So at home in its pale green soap dish, I could feel myself falling again as I felt its turning in my wet hands and caught the scent of lavender and stone.
mindfulness, bringing us into contact with life. So, please become aware of your body sitting here. I call this plopping. Plop. And when I speak of this, and even when, I, even other times, there was a time forty years ago. I had hired a fellow. I was running a group home for adolescents, and I had hired a fellow named Steve who moved here from another city and he, uh, he he got an apartment up up in, in the high northwest sort of doesn't matter where and I took him to his house one day it was a warm afternoon and I parked and uh, he went up to his apartment for five or maybe ten minutes and I sat there in the driver's seat my left arm was on the window and the sun was on it. And I plopped into the present moment. All these years later, that moment is still clear. Why? I was present. If we're not present, we don't form memories, actually. And if we're not present, we can't tell what's happening in our emotions. If we're not present, we can't do the practice of, see, of practicing gleaning beauty or gleaning kindness, of, of experiencing the, the wonders around us. We're, we're lost in our neurotic conditioning. And uh, I, I don't know your neurotic conditioning intimately like I know mine, but it's pretty crazy. It's got some really unskillful presumptions. That, that early conditioning that persists, you know, the stuff that came out of the crucible of our family of origin, that stuff just runs unless we're awake. And so the intervention with the, with the bowling ball is, why not be awake? Why not be awake? And so I invite you now, be aware of your body where it contacts the floor or the chair. And notice your breathing. Not in some cursory, superficial way, but allow awareness to really meet and be intimate with the sensations of breathing. The Buddha would call this bare attention. It doesn't require any interpretation. It doesn't require description. It's just life. When the mind wanders, the same thing happens, but we can be aware of wandering mind. Thoughts, memories, plans. It's not like it's a mistake when your mind wanders. It's not like you're doing it wrong. That's the nature of the thing. We're not even trying to get rid of the wandering mind. It will diminish over time. And sometimes the mind will become really concentrated and there'll be no wandering mind. But when it does wander... That's the reality, and then that can be noticed with bare attention. Continuity of practice. And so here we are, sitting. And please now, allow your memory to remember the desirable eating object 
and let yourself find it and place it in one of your palms. If it happens to be one of those wrapped things, notice carefully what the wrapping is. Does anybody else need something? Oh yeah, you missed it. But don't open it yet. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but I ate it already. <laughs> Notice the wrapping paper. Someone went to great lengths to create that, that marketing tool. Seeing. You were seeing, being aware of the shape and the color. And then, what does it take to unwrap it? Notice the intention and then ever so mindfully tear it open. Hmm. Notice the skill that it takes. It's, it takes some manual dexterity to open something like this. And then get the contents now, notice what you do with the wrapper. Mm -hmm. And then get the contents and maybe, maybe put them in the other hand. Let them go from one hand to the other. And notice the sounds in the room, the sound of unwrapping. What is the sound of candy unwrapping the famous Zen koan? <laughs> and then maybe bring it a little closer. Notice the context of fingers, desirable object. Salivation, maybe. And then very carefully, visually inspect whatever it is. Is it uniform? What color is it? If there's more than one, are they the same? Are they different? Do they have a scent? And to test this, you might bring them closer. Yes, definitively, there's a scent. Are there associations with this scent? And then returning to seeing. Seeing. Grounding back in the body breathing. The body touching the cushion or the chair. Notice any thoughts that there are. There could be thoughts and feeling of impatience. There could be frustration or there could be great interest. It's like, whoa. Who, who knew that desire could take this form? Who knew it could become this strong? Or, or maybe you're not particularly interested in what, what you have on your hand, in which case this could be really boring. In this mind, there was just an impulse to just gobble it. But Let's keep looking, looking and smelling.
Now we could do this for 45 minutes, but we'll run out of time. So instead, I invite you to, in my instance, I have three little somethings here. And I would say, pick one, if you have more than one. And notice it carefully, and then pick it up. And notice, notice what's happening in the mouth. And then ever so mindfully, bring it up so you can see it really clearly. Salivation is happening here. And then how does it happen that the intention forms and then you bring it mindfully to your mouth and then place it in the mouth, but don't chew yet. Notice what you do with your hands. And explore it with your tongue. It may be something that melts, and so then there's flavor, quite a blast of flavor. And then when you're ready, notice the decision to chew. And notice what happens with that. Notice how the texture changes and how the tongue, which is quite an escape artist, the tongue manages to be between the teeth and, out and doesn't get bitten or very rarely gets bitten. It's quite a skill. And notice taste. There's taste in the mouth, sweet, sour, the MSG taste, bitter. But most of flavor is in the nose. Right? And that, that exists only on the out-breath. You can notice that. And then it's gone. And if there's more, you might have one more. Mindfully bring it. Exploring it again with the tongue. Ultimately chewing. Long time ago, I spent one week in Burma with Tankuru Sayadaw. It was he who gave me this black bowl. <clears throat> And every day, well, he gave me a very interesting meditation practice. The first day, he said, through the translator, be aware of seeing all day. No mindfulness of breathing. Just be aware of it. Like right now, you could do it. Be aware of seeing. seeing. Do that all day. 15, 16 hours. When your mind wanders, come back to seeing. Day two was hearing, be aware of hearing, all day. Day three was be aware of your posture, sitting, standing, walking, lying down. Day four was touching, you can do that now, feel where your arms, your hands are touching, or your buttocks are touching. Day five was seeing, hearing, sitting, touching. Seeing, hearing, sitting, touching, all day. No reading, no writing, no distractions. So he would ask, what did you learn about seeing yesterday? And he would also ask, how many bites of lunch did you have yesterday? 
It was one meal a day. There's some particular rules, the Dutanga rules are particularly severe rules that when you sit down to eat, you eat from the top of the bowl down. You don't push anything aside and you count your bites. And I discovered that when I was, I was young and hungry at that point, that it was a large meal if I had 70 bites. That was a huge meal. And of course, when you try to eat, the mind wanders, right? And you get out. <laughs> How do you eat without your phone? Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't use your phone. Maybe you just be aware of bringing, 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 chewing, chewing, swallowing, swallowing. So this is an invitation to turning life into meditation. As I drove over this morning, I live in Beaverton. I come along um, Multnomah Boulevard. It's straight for almost three miles, three and a half miles. And I love driving along there and just driving and being aware of the world rushing into me. And it becomes so obvious that what am I? I'm a field of awareness into which the world rushes. And that's called headless driving. So this, I hope, inspires you to remember to turn off the devices and sometimes, and maybe increasingly, just be present with what is. It's strangely satisfying. So perhaps we have time for one person, if you have a question or a comment, uh, I will ask Beck to bring you this. Wish we had more time, but this is what we have. Let's see if anybody wants to. Anything you discovered in this little exercise? Could check and see if there's anybody on Zoom. Let me see here. Gallery. Anybody on Zoom want to try to share something? It might be a little awkward here, but I, we could possibly make it happen. Quiet. It's a quiet bunch. Somebody there? Thank you. I could, I could make a comment. Oh, hang on. There's someone. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Larry. Um, well, bring my picture in. <laughs> yeah. A long time ago in my twenties, I was in Madison at a, at, at the only Sashin I ever did at the Madison Zen Center and uh, sitting here eating my kimchi in my bowl. <laughs> I remembered eating at the Zen center, you know, through quiet meditation for three days. And I actually can still remember the beans that we were eating and how delicious they were, how amazing delicious they were. And that's a memory from 40 years ago. So just a comment. Thank you, Larry. And one person had a hand up here, I think. Oh, hi, I'm Jack. I was completely intrigued by the chocolate. Is it solid and it was melting in my mouth melting melting and there's this tiniest little peanut because i before i even hit the peanut oh it's just solid chocolate and it melted and melted and just intrigued me it was a moment of focus so a lot of curiosity yes mm -hmm. anybody else carlita That kind of blew my mind. Honestly, I've heard about this type of meditation, you know, a raisin <laughs> sort of thing. I've never done it. And I was surprised at how much more opened up and all those different dimensions of it. I just had never appreciated how actually interesting a chocolate covered coffee bean could be. 
in all those different dimensions. And when you mentioned how the, the, the flavor, I think, is only on the exhale, I had never noticed that. That was amazing. I mean, it was just, I, I think I kind of look at these things as chores in a certain way. Some part of me regards um, meditation as a, and, and presence as a, as a chore I have to attend to. And it was really neat to just be like, oh, it reminds me of this line from Eckhart Tolle where he talked about how uh, presence is like stepping outside of a nightclub and expecting the dark night to be boring. And then you actually tune into how actually fascinating the quiet night and nature is. Mm. It's very much like that. Thank you. Wow. What to do when nothing's happening? <laughs> of course, reach for your phone. No. Just be. Drop into the breath. And one last thought. What is spiritual discipline? It's not what they taught me in Catholic school. In grade four, I got the strap, which was a leather strip, black leather strip, for which one had to put out your hands and get beaten because I got snow on my back at recess. Serious stuff. See how I turned out? <laughs> I did get rescued from that in the next year, but spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline is doing that which you know you really, 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 really want to do. There's lots of superficial desires and lots of conditions, lots of fantasies. Well, if I do this, then that'll be satisfying. But what is it I really, really, really want to do? And when contentment and ease and curiosity and so on are available simply through being, our process through life tends to move more and more to being rather than to doing and consuming. So spiritual discipline. I encourage you to be very disciplined, which means pay attention to what you really, 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 really want. So with that, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming on Zoom. And let's make our big circle and we'll do that simple chant and then we'll go have some tea and coffee and things. Now, how do I do this? I go like this. So please come up. We'll make a big circle. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. And squish in here so we get a few people in the middle going out to the Zoomers. Greetings. <laughs> oh gosh yeah let's uh let's do something a little more vigorous than the bhava tu sabe mangalam i learned this 30 some years ago it's a practice from the sufis it's a practice from islam it's the practice of ya fatah and there are oh, actually, I want to draw you over there. That's our little our little Islamic corner on the, the east wall there. The the um, the writing, the Arabic writing, uh, comes from a, a shop right outside Rumi's tomb in Konya, and it says Bismillah er Rahman er Rahim. Oof.
for just a moment there, I remembered. I remembered the open season on Islam. It's okay to. It's okay to speak ill. That beginning of the prayer means we begin in the name of Allah, whose names are compassion and mercy. There are 98 more beautiful names of God, one of which is, and don't be troubled by the word God, it doesn't mean some gray-haired man sitting up in on a cloud somewhere, it means the mystery. It means that which can't possibly be spoken. It can only be understood with the heart. So one of those names is Yafatah. And Yafatah means, may the path of your heart open before you. And it's not, as I always say with this, it's not a namby-pamby little Buddhist chant. It's one that's got some real power, real throat to it. So you take a broad stance and you extend chi to the center of the, of the earth. It's 4,000 miles down into liquid iron. And then you become very mindful of the hands to left and right. And then you bring your hand, you relinquish these if you can, and then come bring your hands to your heart. And so what would it mean to you for you to wish everyone in the direction you're facing around the whole world, may the path of your heart open before you. And we do it three times, and you bend your knees a little bit, and we do it with full voice. So it's ya fata, three times. Take a deep breath in. Ya fata! Ya fata! Ya fata! Thank you, dear friends. Please come have a cup of tea, and I look forward to seeing you soon. I so for those of you that are here for the first time, let me just mention, there is an every weekday morning gathering at 7 a.m. that you can join. You can look for the link online. Uh, but I forgot YouTube. Oh, I just forgot to press the button. But we can upload it to YouTube. All right. See? Yes. I just forgot to push the button. Oh, help yourselves. Take a handful. Take some for the kids.